not a whole lot of people have paid attention to them. Um, and so that really kind of hits the, the core of our strategy as the Center for Species Survival New Mexico is focusing on uh, these small diminutive things that other folks may not may not be paying attention to or dedicating resources towards. And I think it lines up really well with uh, Reverse the Reds mission as well in that there are so many low hanging fruit from a conservation perspective. And, and in some cases it can be, you know, five or $10,000 that means the difference between recovering a species or having that species fall off the edge of extinction. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is now a partnership between Pelicanus and Reverse the Red. In this series, we will highlight the scientists, organizations, institutions, and communities focused on reversing the trend of biodiversity loss and recovering species on the IUCN Red List. We are so excited to announce this partnership and to get these amazing success stories out to the world, spreading optimism for the conservation of biodiversity. For this episode of The Possibilist, as part of our year of action, the theme is invertebrates. We talked with Anna Walker and Tim Lyons of the New Mexico Biopark Society, and we wanted to learn everything they do to conserve and restore populations of invertebrates in New Mexico and beyond. So enjoy our conversation with Anna and Tim, because they do some pretty amazing work. All right, I'm so excited to be joined by you two today. Anna, Tim, um, welcome to The Possibilists. If you um, wouldn't mind starting out and introducing yourselves to get us started, I'd really appreciate that. Hi, I'm Anna Walker. I'm a species survival officer for invertebrates at the New Mexico Biopark Society. Yeah, hey Taylor, thanks so much for having us. Uh, I'm Tim Lyons, I'm the Director of Conservation for the New Mexico Biopark Society, um, and I'm a total fish nerd. So I know a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is invert focused, but if we wanna get into things with spines, we can do that too. I love that, Tim, thank you. Thank you both, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're, uh, we're gonna talk about inverts today for the IUCN's um, Reverse the Red uh, program. We're gonna focus all on that, but I'm so fascinated to hear about the New Mexico Biopark Society the inverts, and we can definitely talk about fish. Um, but Anna, you just gave us your title, Species Survival Officer. That is one of the coolest titles I've ever heard of. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, that title certainly gets a lot of attention, <laughs> and it's a, it's a really cool title to have. So basically, um, at the New Mexico Biopark Society, we have a Center for Species Survival, or the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico. So we work in partnership with the Species Survival Commission of the IUCN, uh, basically to build capacity for species conservation. So that can look like a lot of different things, but uh, typically at the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico, that means we do a lot of assessment work. So we are trying to look across different groups of taxa that we each focus on. For me, that's invertebrates, and more specifically, it's usually uh, insect pollinators. And, and just looking at those groups and trying to figure out which species are in need of conservation attention. Um, as you were just um, describing uh, your work a little bit, um, I have my milkweeds out in my front yard right now and a, and a little monarch flew by. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be auspicious. <laughs> um, that's really So how did you get involved? How, how did you get interested in inverts and, and pollinators specifically? Where, where did that come from? Yeah, I, I suppose my interest in insects goes back to my college years. Um, I, growing up, I spent a lot of time outside and as I started to think about what I wanted to do for a living, I just kept picturing myself in a career that brought me outside as much as possible because that's where that's where I'm happiest. That's where um, I feel most at peace. Um, so I studied biology and I took a lot of ecology courses. And uh, once we started to kind of specialize on different 
groups, I took an entomology class and I realized that insects are not only the building blocks of every, pretty much every ecosystem, at least terrestrial, but there are so many different really fascinating life histories and you can learn something new about insects every minute of every day for the rest of your life and, and never get bored. There's just so much diversity, so many incredible species. And so once I just started getting introduced to insects, that was it. Um, I never really looked back. I love that. And I think some of the things I'm really excited to talk about with you today are the fireflies, um, your New Mexico butterfly monitoring network, uh, the Sacramento mountains checker spot. Um, I I'm really, really curious to hear about those and, and more of your projects. But Tim, um, I want to hear more about you. What is the conservation, um, conservation director, correct? Was that the title? What does the conservation director do for the New Mexico Biopark Society? And, and how did you get involved? How did you get interested in conservation in general? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Miami, actually, Miami, Florida. I'm not a New Mexico native, um, but most of my childhood was spent um, kind of going back and forth between Miami and the Florida Keys. And so when I was growing up, I was really interested in, in marine biology and um, everything that goes along with that. But I mean, even within my lifetime, from the amount of time when I started diving, when I was about 12 or so, to, you know, now, um, so that's just 15 years or so. Um, since that time, I've seen like true shifts in coral reef structure in the Caribbean. I mean, there's, there's a, a huge loss of coral structure and um, it, it was just really stark to see. So um, that's kind of what brought me into the conservation field. I come from a background in invasion ecology. So uh, most of my work has been spent looking at invasive species and the impacts that they have on ecosystems. Um, and in particular, uh, grad school, I spent some time looking at lionfish impact in the Caribbean. So um, that was kind of the tie in with the marine bio stuff. Um, and then after getting a degree in marine biology, I moved to New Mexico, uh, to the middle of the desert <laughs> and, uh, put that degree to use working on freshwater fishes, which I really feel is a, a pretty underrepresented group of species. Uh, they live in, you know, 1% of the, the world's water surface, but there's, uh, about as many freshwater fish as there are marine fish. Um, so that's, that's always an interesting statistic that I throw out. Um, but yeah, my, my role at the New Mexico Biopark Society is, as conservation director is one to oversee the Center for Species Survival that we've built over the last several years. And two, to make sure that all the conservation that we're engaged with is impactful and meaningful and that we're, uh, we're spending our fairly rim limited resources as well as we possibly can. All right, I think the next best thing for us to do is to understand the New Mexico Biopark Society. So uh, maybe Tim, Tim, is, is this a good question to ask you? Um, can you explain the New Mexico Biopark Society, its relationship to the zoo, to Albuquerque? It's in Albuquerque, correct? Yeah, just t tell us about it. Tell us um, about the society and what you're focused on. Sure. So the New Mexico Biopark Society is the support nonprofit for the Albuquerque Biopark. So the Albuquerque Biopark is a municipally run facility, um, but the New Mexico Biopark Society's role is to essentially generate funding for uh, all of the mission-based work that the Albuquerque Biopark participates in. And so uh, the New Mexico Biopark Society fully funds the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico that operates in conjunction with the Albuquerque Biopark. Um, it also puts on a number of, of events throughout the year uh, to generate revenue for everything from animal welfare to uh, new veterinary equipment to uh, you know cool conservation events and fundraisers and conservation projects like the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico. 
Um, so in, in relation to the Albuquerque Biopark, the society staff is actually pretty small. Uh, so I think we've got about 15 employees at the moment. And uh, we, you know, our, our main role is to make sure that there's funding available uh, to do cool stuff. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about the Center for Species Survival uh, in New Mexico? Yeah, sure. So uh, the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico, or CSS New Mexico for short, was established in 2018 to really build capacity um, for conservation around three major groups of organisms. And, and those three are uh, pollinators, more specifically invertebrate pollinators, uh, plants, and then freshwater fishes. So when you look at the IUCN's Assess, Plan, Act conservation cycle, uh, we're pretty firmly seated in the assessment components of that because the organisms that, that we're focusing on um, are going to be those groups that are fairly data deficient, that, that don't have a lot of information known about them. And so there's, there's a huge amount of work to be done in actually making the assessment of whether or not those species are at risk of extinction. And so that, that's what a large portion of our work focuses on. Well, let's talk about the cool stuff. Anna, do you want to share some of your some of your big projects? I know that you've sent us um, over some really fascinating ones. Feel free to start with any of them, um, but just know that I'm particularly biased on this New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network. I'm really <laughs> fascinated by that, but feel free. Don't let my bias uh, influence you. So as, as I mentioned, we do a lot of species conservation status assessments. And uh, through that work, I was given a project of North American butterfly species to work on. And compared to most insect groups, there's actually a lot of information out there for butterflies. So quite often when I'm writing red list assessments for different groups of insects, I really have very little information to work with. And it's actually quite hard to determine whether or not something might be threatened with extinction if all we have is kind of a handful of records of, of one species from, from one place. But with butterfly species, um, they're really beautiful and people love looking at them and recording them. And so we have a huge amount of information on all of these different species. And as I was working on these assessments, a lot of these species are really widespread across North America and we, I was finding really good data for a lot of them, but I was noticing that here in New Mexico, uh, the picture wasn't quite as complete as it was for some of our neighboring states. And so I started to do a little bit of digging and trying to figure out, well, why is that the case? Why are there these data gaps in New, New Mexico? And then beyond that, how can we fill in these data gaps? And I came across the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network. And this is a group of about 30 to 35 programs that all collect butterfly data in a standardized way. And each program is a little bit different. Most of them are kind of state-based programs, but others are maybe based at a national park um, or um, just in, a, in an area governed by um, some sort of nonprofit. And it's a really cool network because they all collect the same butterfly data in the very in the very same way so that you can compare across um, huge areas kind of what's going on with butterfly diversity and abundance. So I decided to start a similar program here in New Mexico. So back in 2020, we started the New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network. And um, being under the umbrella of the North American Butterfly Network made that really easy because we had kind of protocols to go off of that we just had to adapt slightly for our climate. Um, and then also they already had a data entry system, so I didn't have to think very hard about how I was going to take all of this survey data that volunteers were collecting and get it to a place where it's useful to a large number of people. Um, so then in 2021, we kind of rolled out the program in force. And I think that first year, we maybe had about 15 routes. 
and um, now this past year we had about 40. So we're, we're growing pretty quickly. Uh, we're trying to establish routes in as many eco regions and habitat types across the state as we possibly can. Um, and then the idea is that over the years we'll have this incredible uh, record of, of what's going on at all of these individual sites not only in New Mexico, but because this is something that's happening across the country, it's a, a huge amount of data that's being generated and similar data is already being used in really remarkable ways to look at butterfly diversity and abundance. And, you know, in, in the invert world, I mentioned we, we have a lot of data deficiency. We don't actually know that much about most insect species. Um, so, you know, we've, as a research community, there's a consensus that insects are in decline. Unfortunately, what we don't know is exactly what species are being impacted and how many species are being impacted. And oftentimes we don't even really understand the drivers of those declines, um, but we know that it's happening. So it's, it's on us to be as res resourceful as possible and start kind of collecting this data so that we can actually quantify these declines and we'll have a much better idea of how to address those declines if we can understand them better. That's amazing. That's so incredible, especially that, you know, starting in 2020 and you've gone from 15 to 40 routes and, and how many volunteers uh, do you have uh, in that program? Yeah, so I think some routes have multiple volunteers, so we have around 40, 45 volunteers that participate in this program. I love that. You know, having citizen scientists come out and help is such a, it's such a gift for so many different reasons. One is to, you know, help us with our budgets and everything, um, but then also to be able to work with people in the community and in, in the places where these animals live, where these plants live that we're trying to take care of. So I love that you're actively making that a part of your process. Um, but you're, you spoke to declines, the de declines in invert populations and how we don't fully understand, um, you know, all the interactions. Do you mind speaking to the different contributors to these insect declines and maybe use the um, Sacramento Mountain checker spot as a way to, you know, what, what's happening with the Sacramento Mountain checker spot? Where, where is that? What are you guys working on with that? Insect declines like... Uh, declines in animal and plant species generally usually boil down to a few key threats, you know, habitat loss being the main one. Um, and then for invertebrates particu in particular, um, pesticide use seems to be quite a big issue for invertebrates. Um, but in terms of the Sacramento mountain checker spot, this is a subspecies of the Anisia checker spot, which is a, a checker spot butterfly that's fairly widespread throughout the western United States. It's found in quite a few different mountain ranges, Sacramento Mountains in particular. Uh, so these, these mountain meadows are separated by um, stands of, of conifer, uh, you know, very forested woodland areas. And historically, these woodlands were probably opened up by forest fires every 50, 100 years. And those um, po different populations of the butterfly would be able to disperse between these meadows and, and increase the genetic diversity. Um, but starting about 100 years ago, when forest fire suppression uh, became kind of the, the management norm, a lot of those dispersal events kind of ceased. And then from there, um, each of these different meadow systems where this butterfly is have kind of just been impacted by different threats over the years. And one by one, unfortunately, this subspecies has disappeared from all but one of those meadows. And while those were kind of the main threats historically, um, now, the main threat to the persistence of this subspecies seems to be drought. Um, probably because of climate changes, droughts in the Sacramento mountains have become much more severe 
much more prolonged, uh, much more common. And um, the these mountain meadows where the butterfly resides have just been completely degraded. Um, the, this particular subspecies only feeds on one host plant, the New Mexico penstemon or penstemon neomexicanus. And this is uh, one of the only plants that is quite drought tolerant. So it green, when it greens up in the spring, often it's the only thing to eat. And there's a lot of elk out there that will graze this plant down to the ground. And also, unfortunately, a lot of feral horses, uh, which seem to be kind of the major problem for this butterfly at this point. Wow, talk about getting hit from all angles. When the elk are eating the, the only, the obligate, you know, plant that you've got, you know, you're trying to compete with everything else. So what, is, what are you and the Biopark Society doing to help the Sacramento checker spot out? In 2021, it was only found in two meadows, and that's when uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided that they needed to do everything they could to get the last remaining uh, adult individuals into captivity. So they reached out to us at the Albuquerque Biopark in 2021 and asked us if we would be willing to try our hand at rearing these butterflies. So in 2022, we agreed. We set up a little rearing room for the butterflies and we went out in the field with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and some other partners and we looked for this butterfly species and uh, it took us a while to find it. We were out there for the better part of a week and finally, maybe it was day three, maybe even day four, we finally found one. <laughs> um, it kind of clumsily flew up the meadow and um, as I saw, I had never seen one of these butterflies in the wild before, but I knew immediately when I saw it that it was something that I hadn't seen yet and probably exactly what we were looking for. So I was worried, you know, it had taken us so long to even see one individual. I was worried that I wouldn't be able to net it. But this was honestly the most clumsy, clumsy butterfly I've ever seen in my entire life. And it just crashed into a clump of grass and I was able just to put my net over it. So that was the first, that was a female. We were excited to get a female. Uh, we brought her into captivity and then over the next few days, um, they caught three additional individuals. So we, in the end, we ended up getting two females and two males um, at the biopark. We had success mating one of the males, both females mated with, with him and went on to lay hundreds of eggs. I think in the end, we had about 120 larval caterpillars. Uh, another huge task in this whole process was getting our hands on the host plant. These butterflies will only feed on uh, Penstemon neomexicanus, which is only found in the Sacramento mountains as well as some of the neighboring mountains. So it has a slightly broader distribution than the butterfly itself, but still not a very widely distributed plant. So we ended up having to go out into the field um, in a part of the distribution of the plant where there are no butterflies and we actually wild dug I think it ended up being almost a hundred plants and brought them back to the biopark and started growing them so that we would have something for the caterpillars to eat so that was a huge task as well we had a lot of partners help us with that effort uh, mostly it was the Institute for Applied Ecology um, the Forest Service as Forest Service as well. They were um, incremental in helping us get a hold of those plants to feed those hungry caterpillars. I'd also uh, shout out our horticulture staff. I mean, they've done such an awesome job. The, the production greenhouses for the facility are right behind our office. So every time we go into the facility, we have to walk past tables and tables of penstemon. So it's just really cool to see how they've been able to propagate that plant over time uh, from the original collections. I love that. I'm a I'm a plant person myself, and so I it, the moment that you mentioned the the pentstemon, I was like, oh, I can only imagine the need to scale that uh, that up right there. So yeah, and, and you know, also I gotta say, 
I got goosebumps when you were telling me the story of like, you know, finally finding after three or four days that one butterfly flying around because I've had similar experiences where you've, you've never seen a species in the wild. And then the moment you do, you, for some reason, you just know that that's the one, that's it. And that's such a special feeling. After days and days of being out there, we didn't think we were going to find them. And, and before you get out in the field, you know, you kind of learn about this species, you learn how threatened it is, but it's always hard to tell, you know, what, what the situation is going to actually look like until you get out there and you see how degraded this habitat is. And then for days on end, you don't see a single individual butterfly and, it, and it's really, it's really disheartening. So when we did finally find one, uh, we were pretty, we were pretty ecstatic and we were just relieved that we were able to get uh, a few females and a few males as well. Love that. So, so that's what you have now at, at your facility. You have a bunch of Pinstamon growing up with your horticulture team. You've got uh, butterflies that you're just, you're keeping growing. And, and what, what's the, what's the goal? What are you, what are you trying to get to? What is, what's the process on this? We are working closely with the recovery team run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're all just trying to kind of think through what the next steps are. Uh, we're hoping that next year is more successful. Uh, we also do have some spermatophores in cryo storage. So even if we have, you know, one adult female, <laughs> we could artificially inseminate her and, and try and continue the captive population that way. Um, it'd be good to introduce some new genetics into the reared populations because it seems like inbreeding depression could absolutely be one of the reasons that these captive individuals are not developing like they should be. Um, so we're also trying to do some work to look at the genetics and figure out if that is what's going on. And if that's the case, um, start thinking about how we could supplement that and try and introduce some, some new genetics into the population. Yeah, the cutting edge of understanding the species and the cutting edge of trying to recover the species and both of those things overlapping at the same time. Well, we're definitely going to be as an organization, you know, let alone individually, definitely going to be keeping an eye on this because this is really remarkable what you and your team are doing. I have to also shout out Clay Meredith, who is our species survival officer for plants. Um, in addition to all of the, the captive rearing stuff that we're doing with Sacramento Mountain Checker Spot, Clay actually put out a direct fund, uh, funding request to the Biopark Society membership Mm -hmm. um, to fundraise for a series of uh, exclusion fencing to place around critical habitat to um, hopefully keep feral horses and uh, and native elk out of those patches. And it was wildly successful. So just seeing our members' uh, response to this conservation project is a really good indication for us that um, that the small things do matter. Um, and And obviously, in this specific case, plants were kind of half of the puzzle. So um, yeah, having having Clay and Anna come alongside this project and work together kind of from those two different angles was um, really interesting and exciting to see how it all how it all worked out and how it's continuing. That's fantastic. I appreciate you adding that because uh, just in my own experiences, sometimes it is just like real easy lifts, like fencing around an area that can alter you know what's going on and so i appreciate that so much um and i love that your society membership responded so so uh voraciously <laughs> in trying to to help that um so that's really fantastic well you know you both mentioned um the fish and wildlife service so i'm, I'm curious and tim this is a question for you um what are your relationships with i don't know so many different entities you know you have the biopark society on one end your membership on one end your volunteers on one end and then you also have you know the the, the state and the, the federal regulatory agencies involved and 
Um, I'm curious because you had mentioned in some of the materials you sent over the Socorro isopod. Um, and so maybe share some of that experience in, in understanding that, uh, that animal and the relationships with some of the, you know, different partners that you work with. Yeah, sure. So on the partnership piece, uh, we've, we've been really deliberate over the last few years to make sure that we're, we're building partnerships and helping out different, uh, state and federal agencies when they call out requests for support, um, Clay and Anna have done a phenomenal job of that. But uh, yeah, the Socorro isopod is <laughs> a really interesting one. I'm excited to give it a few minutes in the spotlight. Um, so the Socorro isopod is uh, a species of freshwater isopod that occurs in a warm desert spring about an hour south of Albuquerque. Uh, and it's a, a pretty small little spring system. The species occurs nowhere else in the world. Um, and it was listed on the Endangered Species Act in 1978. Um, the interesting thing with Socorro isopod is that it's probably, at least in my opinion, one of the most data deficient ESA listed species ever. Um, I mean, not a whole lot of research has been done on it. Uh, the last time the red list assessment, the IUCN red list assessment was updated, was 1996, um, so that's definitely due for an update, and it's currently assessed on the red list as extinct in the wild. Um, we don't really know whether or not that's the case. Uh, so the the type locality is on private land. Um, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish historically had a really good relationship with that landowner, but they haven't been able to get in contact with them for the last six or seven years, I believe. And so nobody has checked on the type locality in, in quite some time. There is also uh, an artificial series of ponds that are fed by that, that same spring source, and that's called the Socorro Isopod Propagation Facility. And it's basically a series of uh, concrete tubs in the ground. So. Clay, Anna, and I went out with uh, Game and Fish probably about four months ago now to uh, do some routine sampling at the Socorro Isopod Propagation Facility. Um, and it's it's such a resilient little creature. I mean, those, those concrete tanks are chock full of Socorro Isopods. Um, the Biopark has also held this species in, in an ex situ population since 1990. Um, so we've been holding on to this critter for quite some time, just in case something goes wrong with the type locality, the spring system dries up. Um, I think at one point somebody decided to push a burning car into the type locality back in the in the 90s. So there's been some weird stuff that has happened um, at that type locality. But as far as we know, the species uh, may still be extant there. Um, so the type locality was converted into a series of bathhouses at one point. Um, subsequently, those bathhouses have been removed. Uh, there's still some, some concrete piping and stuff. So there's, there's still evidence that the habitat has been pretty heavily modified. Um, but, but we think that the Socorro isopod might still be extant there. Um, and so the, the biopark is, uh, working with game and fish on, on some field surveys, uh, we're really interested in getting to the type locality and seeing what kind of shape it's in uh, and doing some sampling there whenever that becomes possible. But in the meantime, we're, we're holding the species ex situ uh, as an assurance population. And we're also planning to update that, that outdated red list assessment once we have a little bit more information on the species. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a really cool little critter. Um, hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention unfortunately i think it ne probably needs a little bit more um but it, it's, it's definitely resilient um and and we're excited to to continue working on it that that whole project has been um really interesting it's it's kind of just been a big game of detective really just trying to figure out what different people know about it um and it's still a fairly new project so we're not quite sure how, how the bioparks role will shake out ultimately, but we're going to give it as much support as we can. 
burning cars, bathhouses, trying to work with the feds and then also private landowners. Yeah, it's definitely a detective game. It's definitely a big puzzle. Um, before we step away from it, do you mind ex describing what this isopod looks like? I mean, is it as as big as a, a burning car itself or is it as small as a little flea? Where, 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 what is the thing fighting off this burning car? Uh, so it's actually quite diminutive. Uh, I think the the largest adults are probably up about the length of your thumbnail. Uh, so it's pretty small. And uh, a lot of the individuals are, are either kind of like a ruddy, ruddy brown or like a ruddy orange color. Um, so they're, they're really kind of cute. Um, you can see their, you can see their eyes. Their eyes are very distinctive. Um, they do do it. They, they exhibit this really interesting behavior called mate guarding. So the big males will uh, grab a female, roll her up because they're, you know, they're freshwater pill bugs essentially. So they look quite similar to the little roly polies that, that some of the audience might see around their properties. But um, yeah, they'll roll a female up, grab onto her and then carry her around for a few days. So, so no other males can, can get at her. It's a, it's a pretty interesting behavior. And we were, we were able to see that in the field a few months ago. So that was pretty cool. Is that uh, the new children's book, Roly Poly versus the Burning Car? <laughs> <laughs> I think it would work out nicely. Yeah, man, that's fascinating. I, I love that all the different components to, to these stories of how to make conservation work. Um, well, that leads me to my last uh, question about your projects, and unless you guys have more. Um, so, well, I guess I did my, uh, my grad work in South Carolina, and being from the West Coast my whole life, never really seen fireflies, or cicadas for that matter. And I get over to South Carolina, and every summer, there is just this this cacophony of cicadas just yelling and screaming at me. I have no idea what's going on. And there's lightning storms and just rain just dumping out of nowhere. And then every day at dusk, these little fireflies come up and it makes it one of the most magical experiences with all those things combined. So I'm really fascinated um, about your firefly work, Anna. Um, and I'm just really curious to hear about what you and your team are doing on, on the fireflies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love fi fireflies are such fascinating little insects and I could honestly talk about them all day, every day. So I'd love to talk about fireflies. Uh, back in 2020, I think it was, I embarked on a red list assessment project with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Uh, we worked closely with the Firefly Specialist Group through this whole process. And we were basically trying to assess all described species from North America. We ended up assessing about 132 out of about 170. And what we found was that the majority of species, more than 50% of them, were data deficient. Uh, there were a few threatened fireflies identified, but the majority, we just didn't have enough information. Uh, and not only that, I grew up in the western United States, uh, in Colorado, and I had never seen a firefly, at least kind of the flashing firefly that people typically think of when they think of a firefly. And through this assessment project, I was finding all these records of some of these flashing species in Western states, like New Mexico, like Colorado, um, like Utah. And it got me thinking that I would love to better understand exactly what species we have out West and where they're found. Uh, fireflies are reliant on water, so they're usually quite habitat specific. This is one of the reasons that a lot of them seem to be in decline. Um, as we know, there's a lot of um, competition for fresh water sources, uh, not only with other wildlife, but with humans as well. So a lot of freshwater habitats have 
uh, decreased across North America for the last few hundred years. And that's probably why a lot of the firefly species are declining as well. Uh, for fireflies, light pollution is also uh, a major threat. But anyway, we thought we better start trying to understand what species we have out west before they're all gone, because a lot of them do seem to be um, threatened. So I uh, basically decided that I was going to locate some of these historical flashing firefly populations in New Mexico, um, but I didn't really know where to look. So I sent some kind of general questions out to the public in New Mexico via things like Facebook <laughs> to see where people have seen flashing fireflies. And I got a huge response. Most people would kind of say, no, they're not here. I've lived here my whole life and I've never seen them, so they can't be here. Um, but every once in a while I would get a suggestion of a site to check and in 2020 and 2021, I spent a lot of time over the summer visiting a lot of different sites looking for fireflies. And eventually, I started finding them. Uh, so now, I think before I started this effort, there were two records of flashing fireflies in New Mexico from a couple different species. And now, we know of more than a couple dozen firefly sites across the state of New Mexico. They seem to be present in pretty much every mountain range here. Um, a lot of sites across the eastern kind of prairie region. Uh, so they are actually a lot more widespread and a lot more common than we ever could have imagined. And, and we have at least five species of the flashing fireflies. Um, we don't even really know what a few of them are. I, I suspect that we might end up describing them as new species at some point because they just don't quite fit in with similar species in the eastern United States. Uh, so yeah, it's been a really incredible effort. Uh, another thing, so with this over 50% of our firefly species in North America, we just don't know enough about them to know whether they're threatened with extinction. I've been working closely with the Xerces Society on their new project. It's called Firefly Atlas, and it's basically a large effort to better understand the firefly fauna of North America. And again, we're relying very heavily on community scientists uh, trying to better un understand our insect populations is just such a huge task that without enlisting thousands of people all across the country, it certainly wouldn't be possible. There certainly aren't enough entomologists or insect ecologists to get the work done alone. So it's been, it's been really fun to work with people from all different backgrounds uh, who have just a small interest in the natural world and, and getting them out to help us kind of fill in some of these data gaps. That's so cool. I love it's like a, in a way it's almost harkening back down to the to the amateur naturalist uh, and that combination with the professional naturalist and all that and the fact that you're doing that for such a important project is just fascinating and and just really remarkable. I just want to say um, I think the the projects that Anna is involved with and some of the freshwater stuff that we do and and certainly the plant work that Clay Meredith is involved with, um, they all, well, obviously they're very diverse taxonomic groups, um, but they share one thing in common and that's that not a whole lot of people have paid attention to them. Um, and so that really kind of hits the, the core of our strategy as the Center for Species Survival in New Mexico is focusing on uh, these small diminutive things that other folks may not may not be paying attention to or dedicating resources towards. And I think it lines up really well with uh, Reverse the Reds mission as well in that there are so many low hanging fruit from a conservation perspective. And, and in some cases it can be, you know, five or $10,000 that means the difference between recovering a species or having that species fall off the edge of extinction. 
a really powerful message and also a really great opportunity for the zoo and aquarium community in particular to start maybe shifting perspective on where we place the lion's share of conservation funding. Um, there are so many cases where we can do a lot with a little, and, uh, and I, I just think it's worth recognizing that. I appreciate you bringing that up because in a way you kind of anticipated my next question, um, speaking so closely to that, you know, with reverse the red, um, what we're trying to do for this year of action uh, is tell these stories of, of positive action for all these different species. So um, maybe you could elaborate on that more in, in speaking like, what does this work? You know, this is a question to both you, Anna and Tim, like, what does this work um, to try to reverse the red for a species mean to you personally? Um, so I, I think for me personally, it's, it's a shift in the way that we view conservation and whether or not it's working, right? So there are so many good cases of species that we've recovered as a result of conservation interventions. Um, there are also some cases of species that we haven't been able to recover, and that's fine. But um, I think the vast majority of folks look at the state of nature and all they see is, is the negative. And in reality, there are lots of good positive stories that we can be telling to start to shift this narrative that uh, recovering species is impossible. I think it's definitely possible. Um, some of the species that we're working with are, are proof of that. And, and I hope that there will be many more um, before we're through. But focusing on these, these small guys that, that, you know, may be hyper endemic or may just not have a whole lot of resourcing put towards them, I think is a really good strategy to start to do that and to provide more and more case studies and kind of build a lexicon of, of positive conservation recovery over time. Yeah. And for my part, I spend a lot of my time trying to identify what insect species are in need of conservation attention and really just drawing attention to the fact that there are a huge number of insects that are going to need our help over the next 10, 20, 50 years. Um, but what's really cool about insects, and, and Tim has kind of been alluding to this a little bit, but it's actually fairly easy to conserve them if you just try. Um, you know, once you get the habitats restored to a certain level, insects are so resilient. They reproduce really quickly. Um, one female can have hundreds or even thousands of offspring. So really all you need to do is give them a nice cozy place to live and then they do the rest. And, and you know, you can have a huge impact with a much fewer resources when you're talking about recovering insects. So I think that's one thing that's really important to keep in mind. Taking what I'm hearing from you both right now, it's putting my own efforts uh, in my own yard into perspective because I dropped 50 bucks on some milkweed plants and a few seeds and put those in the ground. And over the last year and a half, um, the amount of little monarchs that we have, little caterpillars all over the place. And I, I give out these seeds to so many different people and I'm growing up little, you know, um, uh, little seedlings from the monarch, uh, the milkweed seeds, and just seeing that, you know, we, we barely had a monarch in our yard before then, before a year and a half ago, and now just seeing so many. So it's just like a small little uh, bit toward this larger thing. Both, you know, Anna, you and Tim have been speaking about working with citizen scientists and volunteers, and, you know, we this podcast goes out around the world and we, we, we hear from our audience from all over the place. And so I would love to get your perspective on individual action. Um, what individual actions can people take um, and how can people get involved um, in any of these capacities? Um, so what, what is that perspective for you? Is what, how, how can people get involved in these really critical, globally important efforts? Yeah, I mean, when we think about insects, there aren't a whole lot of other species groups that we share our space with 
so intimately. You know, I can go in my backyard and find hundreds, if not thousands of insect species and maybe a handful of birds, maybe a mammal or two, maybe a reptile. Uh, so that means that we have a really amazing opportunity to impact these organisms in a, in a really powerful way by not even doing very much. Um, so for example, planting a few additional native plants in your garden might help support uh, hundreds of insects. Um, another really important thing to do is not disturb your garden too much when your leaves fall in the fall. Leave them on the ground. That's going to be a really nice place for insects and other invertebrates to spend the winter. Um, another thing that can be fairly easy to do is just think about your light sources outside. Light pollution is a huge threat for a large number of nocturnal pollinators, as well as things like fireflies. Honestly, even for vertebra vertebrates like birds and, and even people. So if we can kind of limit the amount of light that we have outside around our homes at night, that's another area where it's pretty easy to make a, a large impact. Um, and then obviously, just think about the pesticides and the fertilizers that you're using in your yard and try and limit them as much as possible. Those are kind of the things that people can do in, in their own space. Um, but then when we wanna start thinking about other ways to contribute, certainly community science is a, is a really great place where people can connect with nature and contribute to building these data sets that are really, really important for biologists and conservationists to better understand these species and, and better understand how to conserve them. I, I would just say, uh, I would say nurture and cultivate your sense of self wonder. Um, I think that there is so much cool stuff to see when you walk outside and not, not everything that is wonderful in the natural world is, is a charismatic megafauna. Um, so as long as you keep learning and stay curious and get excited when you see new things that you haven't seen before, I would say that that's the, the biggest thing for me. And then, and then share that, that sense of wonder with your friends and with your family um, and with anybody that you come into contact with because nature is a very complex thing and there's a lot to look at and a lot to get excited about. That's so fantastic. Oh man, those are great. Those are great answers. It, you know, Anna is, um, I really appreciate that because, you know, being insect intelligent um, is just even thinking about turning the lights off outside. Just, it's, it's one of those things where you're like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. I got to get into the house late at night. And so, but you know, remember to turn that light off. And those are just little things um, that are just so easy. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And then all the way to the nebulous stuff that you were mentioning, Tim, just that sense of wonder. I think that's a great reminder for everybody. Um, yeah. And I, I really like Tim's comment on just being curious because, yeah. you know, insects get a bad rep sometimes. Sometimes the only insects people notice are the mosquitoes that are biting them or the flies that are hovering over their trash can. But if you just take a little bit of time to look a little bit harder about what's out there, you'll more than likely find that there are some really amazing things to discover. So I highly recommend that everybody just takes a few minutes over the next week or two to see what they can find in their backyards. That's so perfect. You know, and, and thinking about curiosity and wonder leads me into thinking about optimism about the work that we that we all do and the, and the work that you're the projects that you're all working on. And I'm really curious. Um, you know, Michael Soule has this quote when he was asked, are you optimistic or pessimistic about conservation? Um, he said, neither. I'm possibilistic. I focus on what is possible. And we really appreciate that quote. Um, as much as, you know, I came, my bias was I came from a pessimistic place and now I think I'm, I might be uh, more of an optimistic person now, but I definitely love this possibilist perspective. And I'm curious what that quote, what that thought means to either of you. Um, how do you play with those concepts in your own work? 
Um, Anna, do you mind speaking first to that? Yeah, sure. Um, this certainly comes up a lot because when you're doing this work and you're thinking all the time about all of these threats to organisms and this kind of mass extinction event that humans are responsible for, it can be very daunting and it can feel like too much of an uphill battle. And, and so I certainly, there are days when I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the situation. Um, but if it was only pessimism, then I wouldn't be doing this work anymore because there's always really incredible examples of places where we can make a difference. And so getting more people to realize that so that there is a larger effort to kind of make these changes. Um, once you start doing it for long enough, you realize there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. So certainly um, depends on the day, but um, again, there's, there's really a lot that we can do to save species. I think I would classify myself and I think my team would agree as an optimist with, um, you know, somewhat inconsistent slashes of pessimism. So generally speaking, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that there are so many organizations out there that are doing really good work, but I do think that there's, there's room for improvement in the way that we coordinate with one another and in the way that we strategize on, you know, species priority and where those dollars are best spent. Um, so I think we, I think we need to get away from this idea of, of territorial conservation and really, um, just try to do a better job of collaborating with one another because the reality is that there, there is a huge pie, a proverbial pie, and there are not enough people eating from it. Um, but there's, there's so much work to be done and there are people that want to help. So I, f I feel like there's, there's ample opportunity for us all to start communicating a little bit better um, and just being a bit more collaborative. Well, Tim, Anna, thank you so much. Really appreciate everything that you shared with us about your work in New Mexico, how it contributes to species um, all over, and your work with the New Mexico Biopark Society. Um, do you mind telling people where they can uh, get a hold of you or learn more about your work? Follow us on Instagram. Follow the New Mexico Biopark Society. Uh, you'll get some uh, you know, periodic updates of some of the work that we're, we're doing. Um, and also just wanted to, to thank you, Taylor, for giving us the opportunity to uh, get some of these less recognized species out in the spotlight and talk about some of the cool work that we've got going on. And thank you so much for having us. It was really a pleasure to talk with you here today. Thank you again to Anna and Tim for taking the time to talk with us and sharing the amazing work they do. Please check out their website at bioparksociety.org and follow them on social media at NM Biopark Society. Hosts and producers are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producer is Megan Joyce. Images provided by Anna Walker, Jason Schaller, and Serena Jepson. The music was provided by a Picture Book Studios. Thank you for tuning in and we'll talk to you next time.